you're the manager of a franchise of a leading rental car company out in the area somewhere between downtown and the suburbs. You've gotten off the bus a little ways down the street. You've walked sleepily up the sidewalk through the damp morning to the car rental place. You're almost at the door. Now you've inserted the key, grasped the handle, turned the key, and pulled open the door. It's the morning. You usually show up around 8, sometimes 8.30, to get things ready for the day. There's usually not too much to do. You straighten a few pens, brew a large batch of coffee, which, after the three cups that you and your two co-workers pour for yourselves, will sit on the hot pan for the whole day, slowly but steadily becoming burnt and unfit for your customers' consumption. But they will stomach it anyway, because they are little rodents who can't pass up on the opportunity for free coffee. You check your emails. You don't have anything remotely important. Only about a dozen promotions from businesses you'll never patronize. You wonder if there's a way to turn off all these blasted emails at once, as opposed to going through them one by one and unsubscribing from their mailing list. It's not an urgent enough issue warranting that extent of exertion. You catch yourself looking out the window and curse. It's the first of innumerable wistful glances at the outdoors, at the beautiful sky. You nearly grasp this thought. Humans once lived exclusively outside, that is, in nature, In fact, the only inside that could be conceived of was inside a cave. Is modern society really an improvement over that? What do we gain other than the guarantee of a big steak or an apple? And where does a reliable source of food get us other than obesity? You're so close. Push, push, Robert. Come on, come on. Taste knowledge. Taste the reason why we gave up caves. Come on. But you counter the seductive call of the sparse clouds by pulling out your phone and scrolling through social media. Some minutes pass. You grunt into your chin a few times in amusement. Do you realize the toll this scrolling takes on your neck and spine? No, of course not. Nor would you care if it was pointed out to you. Ah, but how dear a soul you are. You are so precious to me. Your coworker Jenny comes in through the back door. You start putting down your phone and say, Hi Jenny, how are you? Good, how about you? Yeah, I'm alright. Did you have a good night? Hmm, did I? Yeah, I think it was okay. I just watched some of that new show, Dating While Pregnant. Have you seen it? No, what's it about? Well, it's actually very interesting. They take these single ladies who are pregnant and they put them on these blind dates with random guys. And then, if the couple clicks, they follow them to see how their relationship will go. Wow, sounds cool. Maybe Ashley's heard of it. Will you and Jenny have an affair? Well, you think that way about every woman you see, no matter their looks or personality. The very fact that they are a woman intrigues you, excites you. Jenny isn't terribly attractive, nor is she revolting. She is an average-looking woman in her mid-twenties who's only been at the car rental place for a few months. There's too long a silence, and Jenny blanches at your abstracted gaze. Um, did you already collect the overnight returns? Oh, uh, uh, no, thanks, ah. She goes over to the little returns box attached to the window and on the way there pours herself a cup of the coffee you made. In the box she finds three sets of keys. She comes back over to the counter and starts fidgeting away at the computer, entering the information about these returns, almost thinking along similar lines as almost you. Is this really my life? Is this what my life is worth? Is this what I want my food to taste like? 
like renting cars to people or rather waiting around in an office with some creepy guy not that i'm not creepy too not that i don't feel the pull of my sexual body to sleep with every male for some boring customer to finally come in so i can finally rent them a car which takes all of five minutes so i can go back to standing around waiting just becoming more numb more old more resentful and what of the people who are actually doing what they want who are actually happy i don't buy it for an instant they can't be truly happy by making art or acting in blockbuster movies or being an activist or being a doctor and saving people's lives no not so long as there's someone like me in a car rental place just rotting the skin off my bones or so and so in the grocery store standing at the cash register waiting just like so many others just as all the unfortunate and unprivileged wait while the lucky or shall i say damned go out and not frolic but loiter hang out languish don't you see the opposite of wait is no longer act it has become waste Yes, that's right. Either they are not truly happy and are being fooled by themselves or are really one of us, just begging to be put out of our misery, or else they are asleep, not knowing the true meaning of happiness. But Jenny doesn't think this, and neither do you. She simply scratches her nose with one hand while clicking away at her mouse with the other, sipping her coffee from time to time and feels her heart sputtering away maniacally within her fra frail rib cage. And you play a game on your phone. In comes Carlos, a longtime employee at the car rental place. He's been here longer than you have, but he never aspired to rise in the company. He makes enough to support himself, his little wife, and his young son, so he is content. Occasionally, he gives you tips about how to manage the business. You take these tips with a stiff nod of thanks. You can't say how much it really means to you. You can't say so many things, like how the tinny radio sounds from underneath the counter playing pop songs. Now we'll spare everyone the details of your ghastly workday in exchange for this tale. Once there was a student sitting in the classroom, but there was no one else in the classroom except for an old plump woman with her hair somewhere between burnt umber and burnt sienna. Ouch! Uh, she'll have me say that she's not old, only middle-aged. Well then, fine. And this student was sitting there, feeling a bit distressed. So the teacher barks, Well, come on, boy, out with it! So you mutter, Why do so many tales begin with once? The teacher withdraws her ruler and begins whacking it against her palm. What a foolish question! How else shall a story begin but once? And besides, once isn't the important bit. The important bit is what follows the once. Well, if that's so, then why not just cut out the once? Now, listen here, boy. How would that be? There was a so-and-so living in somewhere, and such-and-such -such happened to them? Is that what you prefer? Why, yes, frankly, that sounds nice. No once at all. It's good. Idiot, boy! The teacher comes up to the student's desk and starts giving the student a walloping. Oh, I should probably have said this earlier, but there aren't any doors in the place, only three windows on the left-hand side. There's a ceiling fan on, spinning at full tilt. Also, it's unbearably hot in the room, even with all the windows open. Well, uh, but actually, uh, none of that happened. What really happened is that there was this great big war, and all these boys had to go and pretend to be soldiers, and all these girls had to go and pretend to be nurses and helpers, and everyone could only see in grayscale. But that became tricky, because ordinarily the soldiers usually distinguished themselves from one another by wearing different colored uniforms, so no one knew whose side everyone was on. But then someone came up with the clever idea of sewing these big patches on the fronts and backs of their uniforms and on their helmets too, and the patches were the emblems of whatever side whoever was on. But then it became tricky because some other people had the clever idea to make some of the opposite side's patches and sew them on their own uniforms and helmets on top of their real patches and sneak around to the other side of the war and pretend to be the people they actually wanted to kill and then they'd make some huge sneak attack on the bad guys and sometimes they'd get killed in the process but they figured it was worth it because they had already agreed to maybe get killed this way they could probably kill a lot more people 
Well, it got even trickier because suddenly, due to some political disagreement, there weren't just two sides fighting, there were four, and none of them liked each other, and they were all coming at each other from different sides. There were the people from the north, the people from the south, the people from the east, and the people from the west. And they each had different patches on their uniforms and helmets, so nobody knew who to impersonate, because the thing was that sometimes it took days for the opportune moment to launch their sneak attack, and in that time, the soldiers who were pretending to be on such and such side would have to do certain things to prove their allegiance to such and such side as they were impersonating and sometimes that involved fighting in a battle against their comrades. Well, it was easy when it was just the North and the South fighting on one front and the East and the West fighting on another because such and such impersonator could just put blanks into their gun and pretend to shoot at their countrymen. But it started getting really chaotic, well, with everyone fighting each other, and pretty soon most everyone was just firing blanks at each other, and then even worse is that everyone started running out of blanks. But then there was another consequence, and this was very positive. Winter hit, and with it a stalemate, as everyone waited for an infusion of soldiers and supplies and in that time the impersonators who were about 20 percent of each of the four armies had to spend a lot of time with their enemies and of course they came to realize that their enemies were a lot like themselves so then when their resources were replenished and it was time to go back to fighting none of the impersonators really wanted to because they had seen the truth that national borders do not affect the inherent personhood within us all but the problem was that the impersonators own countrymen couldn't see this fact so the impersonators were stuck but then each of the four groups of impersonators conceived of the same solution independently from one another. They would have to confess the truth to those whom they were impersonating and beg for mercy. And this they did, and mercy they were given. Soon the fighting ceased, and all four armies convened together in the center of the battlefield. It was a gray, cold day. The clouds were monstrous. They had a forum and decided that together they should storm each empire one by one, beginning with the north, and should arrest and depose each of their monarchs, and bring all four of them back to the central battlefield, and force the four kings to either settle their differences diplomatically, or fight it out honorably with their own hands, and this they did. Well, none of the kings had a police force strong enough to withstand the combined efforts of four armies, and one by one they were put in chains and thrown among the masses and made to walk like everyone else. The kings were indeed brought to the central battlefield, where they were surrounded by the conglomerate army and made to discuss their feelings with the intent to arrive at a resolution, a compromise. At first, the kings wanted to rip each other's throats out, but then the soldiers started shouting out, you're just looking in the mirror, you're just a bunch of children, a wildfire will only destroy the world, how dare you attack your brothers? What conflict is so large as to necessitate these evils? And the kings realized what fools they were being and fell to the ground where the soft, late winter breeze chilled them. Their pants and robes got soaked with mud and they reached out their arms to commit the abhorrent, to embrace those who, for so long, they had viewed as the, the devil. And as tears streamed from their eyes, a voice came down down from the heavens and said this isn't what happened either here's what actually happened there is indeed a war a very unholy war at that but it is not so plain a war as was described this war is waged by consciousness itself and must be fought if life is to go on this is the war that will never end for although it is easy to resolve conceptually it is impossible to apply practically it is the war caused by the tendency of every being to prefer happiness over not only sorrow but also monotony see at this very moment there is someone being violently raped as well as someone committing suicide murder theft and so on are these bad things of course well would you be willing to give up your lollipops your hot meals and finally your very breath itself which you must admit is a pleasure to you to dispose of these sorrows no of course not but you should for don't you see that your breath itself is not at all breath but is the very cause and origin of sorrow that your simple pleasures your evening walks through the neighborhood your humble cup of tea your little nibbles pawn a tender lobe your laughter your singing train rides bike rides automobiles diapers soups dances Everything that's good about existence necessitates the severed heads, the bleeding pussies, the drug addicts, atomic bombs, and garbage strewn about a busy street. No, you're clearly not convinced, nor am I, for if I was, I'd be dead. Thus, we will cling to our lit-up carousels and saccharine conversations and only give up our breath when God, annoyed that we haven't seen the light after how much time, takes it from us by force. It's nearing the end of the workday and you're hanging in there, having already completed hundreds of identical workdays. And even when you were just starting out, you got through by self-deception, pretending that someday the boredom would end. When a man wearing a small gray hat and a gray suit comes in, muttering under his breath, But by no means do I advocate suicide, for suicide, even for the sake of enlightenment, is never enlightenment, it's only suicide. 
Enlightenment is simply allowing these breaths that are the source of birth and death to extinguish on their own. Do not cling to your final breath. Do not hasten its departure. For what is a breath? It is air. It is insubstantial. By clinging to your breath or by trying to rid yourself of it, you commit the folly that gave you breath in the first place. Do not weep when God rips out your soul and do not weep that your soul is still with you. Instead, rejoice that the nightmare will finally be over. He's standing in front of the counter by now, and you ogle him, utterly bewildered. Excuse me, what are you talking about? The man looks at you with a somewhat perturbed face. Excuse me, but what are you talking about? You do a double take. What? I'm nothing. I'm just standing here. I wasn't saying anything. You're the one who just came in here going on about God knows what. Jenny comes over and stands in the doorway, listening with cool interest. Carlos is out in the yard, performing some light maintenance on the cars. Yes, God does know what I was talking about. What's that? I said God does know what I was talking about. What? What does that mean? I'm speaking quite literally. Okay, well, I'm just going to pretend this didn't happen. What brings you in today? I'd like to rent a car, please. Okay, great. Do you have a reservation? No, is that all right? Yes, sure. I just need your credit card and ID. The man starts fishing around in his wallet. What type of car are you looking to rent? For how long will you be returning the car to this branch? And would you like insurance? The man places his ID and credit card on the counter. His name reads Harvey Johnson. Yes, I'd like a sedan of any make, and I'll be renting it for five days. I'll be returning it here, and no, I wouldn't like any insurance. Thanks. Perfect. Just give me one moment to get you set up, and then we'll go out and take a look at the car. The radio continues to wheeze hazily. The clock hanging up on the wall ticks at about the same volume as the music coming out of the radio. You click-clack away at your computer. The man stands with his arms folded at his waist, looking around pleasantly at the office. He occasionally, I've dreamed this before, glances at Jenny, who looks away quickly without moving her head. All right, Mr. Johnson, you're all set. Please follow me in outside. You hand his cards back to him and go out into the open air, which, being much too wide, is why humans started living in houses. You've been outside maybe four or five times today, and one of those times was for your lunch break. Each time you breathe the fresh air, your legs go weak, and you have to cough to make it look like you're just coughing, not having an experience of God. Here you are, a 2017 sedan, about 40,000 miles. You open the driver's side door and turn the car on. Gas tank is three quarters full. Bring it back that way or more, or you'll be charged 50 bucks. Mr. Johnson nods. All right, now follow me around the car as we perform an inspection of any pre-existing damage. I'll point out the ones we already know about. If you see something I don't mention, don't hesitate to call it out, or you may be charged for it when you return the car. You do as such, mechanically, devoid of passion, thinking about the clouds right above you. If you could only glance up just once, you indicate a small dent, and when Mr. Johnson looks down at it, you take a peek at the sky and nearly fall to your knees. Your breath catches in your throat, and you start coughing again. Boy, I tell you what, it seems like everybody's been coughing these days. You've been eating your citrus there, Mr. He reads your name tag. Mr. Thomas? Thank you, yes. I uh, love the clementines they've been having at the national grocery chain near my house. I think it's uh, just a little dust or something stuck in there. Anyway, you continue the inspection. There are a few blemishes. Now, back at the driver's side door, you hand the keys to Mr. Johnson and say, Well, Mr. Johnson, thanks for your business. Enjoy the car and drive safely. Mr. Johnson smiles and, with the first three fingers of his right hand, grasps his little hat and tips his head slightly. In your periphery, cars roar down the main road. It rained last night and there are still puddles scattered throughout the concrete. A cold gust of wind nips at you and, though it'll only be a moment longer, you wish you were back inside immediately. Mr. Johnson's smile seems to grow larger in proportion to your wimpish discomfort. Remember, Mr. Thomas, there is no secret to enlightenment. Anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you something. If not for money, then for a much more hefty price, your soul. 
You twitch. What? Oh, Mr. Thomas, I didn't know you could hear me. But you said my name. Did I or haven't the faintest recollection? What did I say? You said uh, something about there being uh, no secret to enlightenment. I don't know what that means. Did I? Oh, good heavens, I hope I didn't. I don't know what it means either. Yes, you did. You said it. You Just like you were talking funny earlier when you came in. Strange. Well, you must forgive me. Sometimes my mind wanders. Now I must excuse myself. I'm in a bit of a rush. Thank you for your service. And with this, he gets into his rental car and drives away, leaving you alone, drowning in the horrid maelstrom of the void.